How does that look for all of you? Okay. Okay, so uh, as Di mentioned, uh, today we're starting the trauma block and we're just gonna start with the basic intro to trauma. It's obviously a really large topic, but this is just going to be the introduction to how we kind of go about thinking about trauma and some of those critical diagnoses. Um, I'm Ranjita again. I know it's been a little bit of time, so it's good to see all of you guys again. Um, and of course, just you know, feel free to jump in or put in the chats if you have some questions or if I start ta talking too fast and I'll <laughs> slow down. All right. So first, I just want to kind of give that overview for when we're in the emergency department, our jobs are to identify critical injuries and do what we can to treat emergencies and prevent any worsening injuries from becoming something that is critical or emergent. Um, and a lot of the treatment for trauma does happen in surgery with the surgeons, but there's also a lot that happens in the emergency department. And there's a lot of things that we can do ourselves that we need to uh, focus on. Um, I think before we go into the actual uh, going through how we would want to evaluate a trauma patient, it's really helpful to think about the critical diagnoses in trauma that we need to be aware of. So very quickly, I'm going to go through some of these buckets that we are concerned about major injuries, but we'll be talking about them also a little bit more um, later when we go through physical exam findings and then in um, future uh in future discussions over this month and the next month of trauma as well uh, to go into some of the particular subsections. So when we think about um, intracranial injuries or anything on the head as well, uh, we're thinking about any sort of bleeding, cerebrovascular injuries, you know, scalp lacerations, you can lose a lot of blood from a scalp laceration. Um, then there's face and neck, which really encompasses a lot, um, including unstable fractures, hematomas, nerve injuries, and you can't forget about eye injuries or dental injuries. We're looking at airway compromise um, and, uh, ner and nerve injuries as well. In the thorax, we know that's heart and lungs. So um, blunt cardiac injury would be, or even <laughs> penetrating. Um, you might have uh, tamponade, um, a um, aorta problems, injury, pneumothorax, hemothorax, uh, rib fractures. But those are the main things we're kind of thinking about that we want to keep an eye out for. And then, of course, intra-abdominal injuries, which uh, would be anything that's in the abdomen, your spleen, kidneys, liver injuries, but also thinking about GU injuries as well. Um, and then vascular injuries in total is something we need to keep an eye out for anywhere, both in the extremities, um, vertebrae, um, aorta, uh, and fractures, right? And with fractures, we want to think about, are we having a neurovascular compromise or is there a compartment syndrome? Um, those are all things that we really want to key into. And then lacerations, of course, lacerations, there are plenty that are simple enough for us to do in the ER. Um, but we want to keep an eye out for some of the more complex lacerations, uh, ones that have that go through and through, like, say, the lip or are over a joint or a fracture, which would potentially be an open fracture then or are in a special area. Um, so you keep in mind your critical diagnoses. And like I said, a lot of things that we might be sort of trying to identify can't necessarily be fixed by us here and need to go to surgery. But there are still a lot of different procedures and things that we can do to stabilize that are really important that we have in our back pocket as emergency physicians. Um, and I, before, you know, we have, like here we have uh, set trauma shifts and I, where we see all the trauma patients on shift. And I like to sometimes think through all of these things to make sure that I feel ready to, um, to call on any one of them uh, if needed. So, of course, massive transfusion, keeping an eye on whether when it is that we need to give blood, um, intubation, 
for airway, um, if there's any airway compromise. And then um, dealing with arterial bleeding um, and different ways that we can handle that in the emergency department. Uh, lateral canthotomy, um, ear and septal hematomas, those are still important for us to identify and drain. Um, and then of course, for in terms of doing spinal precautions when necessary or putting on a pelvic binder, um, those are things that we should be doing in the emergency department that would be preventing further injury, right? Um, and then needle decompression, chest tubes, um, pericardiocentesis, um, reduction of, of some sort of dislocation. Uh, some are more important than others to do in a timely fashion. For instance, something like a, a hip dislocation, technically you're supposed to do those ideally in less than four hours so that you don't have any vascular compromise. Um, so keeping an eye on all of these things. And then thoracotomy, which I believe um, is going to be talked about a little bit later as well, um, is also something that may or may not be done. But that usually needs to be when there's a trauma surgeon actually available. Um, do, uh, do you guys do the thoracotomies at, in, in the emergency department at, at your hospitals? Do you know? Die. I was just curious, but yeah, that one is usually in combination with a surgeon that, you know, some places do it, some places don't, um, but everything else is completely in our wheelhouse. And it's good to feel comfortable with potentially doing some of these, especially some of the rarer procedures. Um, so with all of that in mind, then we can go into how I think probably all of us go into evaluating our trauma patients. So a lot of people have been learning, and I think we all kind of learned this sort of ABC approach, which is airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, more recently, uh, people have really been trying to emphasize the fact that sometimes the C comes first, or in this case, kind of hemorrhage control, um, you know, Many times, if someone's having arterial bleeding, you do need to get that under control, maybe even temporarily, before you can really move on. Um, so looking at arterial bleeding, getting any hemorrhage controlled um, for the time being, um, and then of course, airway, can they talk? Um, is there some impending loss of airway? And then breathing, what's their work of breathing, breath sounds, basically how we would evaluate any sort of patient. And a lot of this can be seen on, in the first moments the patient comes into the emergency department. Uh, I think it's also important to note that a lot of times these first three things are done almost simultaneously. So it is important to get to all the airway, breathing, and circulation because those are really critical parts of the primary survey. So don't get stuck on just one thing. Make sure that you are kind of assessing all of these. And it should be doable um, pretty quickly. Uh, and there are options if you have multiple emergent diagnoses, um, you know, and sometimes the patient, if they need to be intubated, for instance, is not optimized to have a more permanent um, intervention. So do think about what kind of intervention you might need to do during the ABCs. So for like instance, uh, hemorrhage control, um, you know, you have options. Like, do you think that you just need to put direct pressure right now because you need to evaluate something else on the on the patient or do another procedure? Or do you have time to do laceration repair or um, just put on a tourniquet? Um, like we said, for the airway, um, do they need to be intubated right now because they have this expanding neck mass? Or is it something where maybe they need to be intubated, but we have some time. Um, and then for breathing, like do they have a tension pneumothorax and their blood pressure is low? Then you might want to do a needle decompression first before putting in a chest tube. So, you know, even for these kind of uh, people sometimes think that trauma can be very algorithmic, there's still a lot of options and it's important to think through um, what is good to do right then, considering the patient you have in front of you and what else might be happening um, at the same time with that patient. Now, coming back to circulation um, in a more traditional sense, meaning blood pressure, um, 
I really want to highlight some pearls as we go through. And one of the main ones is, is that normal does not necessarily mean stable, uh, which I think is something we still already all know, but it's worth reiterating. This chart is a classic uh, chart of the different levels of hemorrhagic shock. And I think it's not something that needs to be memorized, but it's a good um, a good way to show that normal is just not normal, right? So if you look here in the first class of hemorrhagic shock, where you would have a normal blood pressure and pulse rate, many times you can have a blood loss of up to 15% of your blood volume. Um, so you can't be reassured by a normal heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and let's say you just have tachycardia you and a normal blood pressure, that's up to 30% of your blood volume that a patient potentially can have lost. So it's important to, um, to not be reassured falsely by having a normal blood pressure or heart rate. Um, and to really be thinking critically as we go through, uh, evaluating the patient. Um, another, uh, another kind of um, a tool that is used a lot in trauma uh, to evaluate a patient is the shock index. Uh, I, I'm not sure if anyone really uses this. It's sort of a similar idea. It's a very simple calculation. It's the heart rate over systolic blood pressure, which is the shock index. And research has basically found that this, uh, when it's really high, can be associated with higher mortality in patients, which makes sense because it's practically identifying patients that fall into those uh, more severe hemorrhagic shock categories. Um, and if you've heard about this, the thing I really want to mention again here is that, again, normal, the normal value, which would be 0.5 to 0.7, does not exclude massive blood loss. Uh, in fact, there are lots of reasons that patients can have a high, a lower or higher um, heart rate and blood pressure. So, you know, this shouldn't be used to exclude massive blood loss, but it can be used if you have a higher um, value, like eight or above, 0.8 or above, then you may want to hire your suspicion for a significant um, hemorrhagic shock or some type of shock. And if you were considering intubating, this might be a patient that would have a post-intubation crash. So this might be the kind of patient that you would want to resuscitate first before um, potentially intubating if you didn't have to right away. I also think that in the emergency department, you know, when we do these cases, a lot of times um, we are getting a, a history and they give us the vitals right away. But all of us know that in real life, when we have a sick patient, getting a patient on the monitor and getting the um, blood pressure, heart rate, those kinds of things is not that quick and can sometimes take a really long time, especially when the patient is hypotensive. So I really find that this is a pretty useful, um, quick um, trick when I see patients in the emergency department, um, because generally if you can, like, I will usually stand at the head of the bed where, which is at the patient's feet. And if you have a strong pulse in, in their, um, in the pedal pulses there, and it's very strong, then you most likely have a systolic that's above 90. Whereas if you're only getting a pulse in the carotid, then your systolic's basically around above 60. And sometimes this can be a nice rough estimate about where the patient is in terms of their circulation if you are still trying to um, get your blood pressure cuff and things like that as well. So something to keep in mind so that you can really get evaluate those ABCs um, up front. And of course, um, the other big thing that we need to remember when you know, when a patient comes in as a trauma, a lot of times they'll be labeled that way, is that we really have to keep our differential broad and remember that um, that that there are other causes of hypotension. So, you know, vasodilation, that can happen in neurogenic shock as well, right? And that happens a lot with trauma or sepsis um, or if the patient was just intubated. So we can't just anchor on bleeding when there is a trauma. And we have to make sure we're also using a correct blood pressure cuff size. Um, 
once again, probably things that I'm just re, uh, re you know, reiterating uh, that you all probably know, but um, having a blood pressure cuff that is too small for the patient can falsely elevate their blood pressure and vice versa. So um, that is something to keep in mind. And remember pain, stress, those can elevate your blood pressure and heart rate, especially catecholamines are if they're circulating, um, doesn't mean you shouldn't treat the pain. You, you still should treat patients pain, but it's something to keep in mind. And then, of course, our elderly patients, patients on rate control medications, um, they can have uh, false, like falsely reassuring heart rates or blood pressures. Um, and so we really have to keep a high suspicion in these patients um, for a worse um, trauma than what might be seen on the initial vitals. Um, and like, for instance, something like Cushing syndrome, which is when somebody has, uh, when they bleed and they are having almost herniation, that can cause bradycardia and hypertension, right? So we have to have a high index of suspicion in those cases. And then um, not going to go into it too much today, uh, but of course, in hemorrhagic shock, it is always ideal to replace blood with blood. It's not always possible to get it right away. Um, but it, you know, it's something that where if you think that someone is actually leaving, um, losing blood, your best option is to get blood in them and not give them too much saline before they are able to get blood if possible, which not, not always possible, but that's what we want to try and do. I believe if you haven't already, there probably would be another, um, lecture that would go into just all of the, um, ins and outs of, um, of massive transfusion. Um, all right, so I'm gonna just jump to history. Um, you know, I think we, I uh, kind of uh, alluded to this, but mechanism really matters. Um, you know, I'm just gonna give some examples. Uh, this is definitely not all of them, but getting a good history can help you um, clue in to which of those really critical diagnoses we should be extra paying attention to. So for instance, stab wounds, you know, you're worried about that internal bleeding, vascular compromise, um, a fall from a height, uh, you know, have a higher suspicion for spinal or pelvic fractures and calcaneal fractures, for instance, if they had um, jumped feet first, because then they would break down by their ankles. So, um, and then acceleration, deceleration, uh, we want to consider aortic pathology or cervical or spinal cord injuries and keep an eye on that neurologic function there. And realizing that, you know, for instance, um, the height really matters if you're having a fall and speed matters in any sort of high energy speed um, accident, like a car accident or things like that. Um, what you're going to see from a 25 five mile per hour accident is probably not going to be the same as what you're seeing at 60 or something higher. And then of course, something like hanging or strangulation has its own very specific set of possible um, uh, problems like vascular injuries and, um, and C-spine fractures, some of which are only seen on um, x-rays of the neck. So knowing what your history is can also really help you clue in and pay extra attention to certain things first. And, and because of that, that's why it's really important that we uh, obtain an HPI from the um, emergency services that bring us in and or family, whoever it is that brings the patient in. And this is one of those things that, uh, especially when a patient is really sick um, and you're going to do your ABCs and you're worrying about that um, and you have all these emergent things to do, um, it's important if you haven't gotten the history from them to have them stay and not leave before, ha have them stand for a second and make sure you get that information because things, um, th there might be some crucial information there. Um, for instance, it's still very important, just like any medical case to get a medical and um, traumatic, sorry, um, age and uh, comorbidities and med, uh, med, med list. Um, and uh, and what I was trying to say was that uh, medical and traumatic problems coexist, right? We know that. Um, so eliciting some of this other information, like, is there chest pain or was the patient altered before the trauma? Um, that might clue you into there being something else going on. Um, also have the high suspicion for that when the patient is much sicker than 
the mechanism. Um, you know, uh, then you want to kind of con be concerned that maybe there's something else going on that is not just traumatic. Um, for the kind of a lot of times the acronym, right, for the algorithm that is used a lot is this ABCDE. And the D usually stands for disability, which would be the general neurologic function. Um, generally, we use the Glasgow Coma Scale for this. And this is just to get your baseline um, neurologic um, function with, before, you know, just upon seeing the patient. This is also something that you really can do as you're doing the ABCs with the patient um, because it's basically uh, 15 is a perfect score. If they open their eyes spontaneously, if they're oriented or, and they obey commands. Um, so really when you're doing your ABCs, there's no reason why you can't get your Glasgow coma scale um, uh, as well. So the thing I want to say about this, though, is that the trend matters more than the number. And these patients, you should be reassessing them um, very often, especially the ones you're worried about, because things change. And so reassess their vitals and reassess their GCS and start from the top again every time something changes. And the one of the um, one of the dogmas in in trauma had been this idea of a GCS less than eight means you need to intubate, um, which has a really nice ring to it. But um, that's just not necessarily true. Uh, you want to keep an eye on how the patient is doing and follow the trend. Um, sometimes a patient that's less than eight does not need to be intubated. And sometimes they need to be resuscitated a lot beforehand. Um, you know, considering the patient in front of you and their mechanism and their full status is going to be important. I mean, think about uh, all of the patients that are intoxicated, that are uh, a GCS of three. We aren't, we aren't intubating all of those patients because we see them and we know that their mechanism and all of the things that, are like, that, we're, uh, that we're evaluating on them may not be um, traumatic in nature, that we may not be worried about it, and we're not going to intubate someone just because they're a GCS of three if we know that it's just due to an intoxication potentially, right? Um, so you know, use your critical thinking just because the GCS at the first time you do it is less than eight does not necessarily mean you need to intubate. Consider that mechanism and the patient that you have here in front of you. And then for exposure, pretty ex uh, pretty straightforward. We should be um, making sure that we are having a full view of this entire patient and looking for any um, lacerations, bruising, anything else that, we, um, that would be helpful for us to evaluate for any of the critical diagnoses. Um, but I do want to mention, I feel like we're all, um, everyone is always very quick to cut off patients' clothing. And if you have a stable patient, you do not need to cut off clothes. I don't know if that happens in Vietnam all the time, but in the U.S., uh, people are very quick to cut off everybody's clothes and when it's when it's a trauma. And then, then the patient is just cold and then doesn't have anything to go home in. So, you know, obviously it's it's important to do that in your very sick patient and um and you need to get to them fast. Like don't, you know, but in the patient that's stable, uh, remember that they're people too, and they probably don't want to have their favorite shirt or jeans cut off. So and of course, hypothermia does worsen coagulopathy. So in your sick patients as well, even if you're going to be cutting off their clothes really fast, try to get them covered up again as soon as you can after the exposure. Um, a lot of times the where they are is very cold and it's not helpful for your sick patients either. Um, so just to run through kind of those physical exam pearls, uh, you know, we talked about skin, we're really looking for ecchymoses and lacerations. Um, you know, think about your mechanism. If you have a patient that had a, a stab wound, then that's really important to go be checking in all of their folds for extra stab wounds. So, you know, armpits, groin, like you don't want to miss somewhere else where you might have missed um, a, a stab wound. Um, look for lacerations over joints or if there's a likely fracture because you, you can have a, a joint um, capsule um, injury or you could have an open fracture. Um, we talked about looking at the head, but, you know, things like having a, a battle sign, if you have bruising around the eyes or behind the ears, you know, that would tell you that you might be having a more serious bleed. Um, 
or for your eyes, right? Like this is one of the um, important things to see if whether you um, might need to do a lateral canthotomy if they're having proptosis or the pupil is not constricting um, or there's any signs of entrapment if they're not able to move their eyes back and forth. These are important things to, to look for. And then for ears, um, checking for uh, bleeding or CSF that's coming from the ears. Um, the face in general, you're looking for those facial uh, um, bone in, in instabilities um, and through and through la uh, lacerations and dental trauma. So don't forget about these. It may not be on your first pass, but you, when you go through, you want to look for things like that. They're still very important. And um, the, the nerve function, don't forget about checking for nerve function in the face. What you think looks like a, a very simple laceration might really need a specialist um, if there was a laceration to one of the, um, the nerves. Um, for the nose, look for septal hematomas. Um, that's important to drain so that they don't have necrosis in their, in their nose. Um, and for the neck, you want to check midline tenderness, um, check for any sort of expanding hematoma. Hopefully you would have seen that on your initial look at the patient, um, and tracheal deviation. Hopefully once again, you caught that in the beginning, but you want to make sure in, in, that you are looking through all of those things. Um, you know, a lot of times, uh, like uh, lacerations through the parotid or the platysma can be something where you might want to get your um, your specialist involved or have a, a better um, look at them to see whether there's something more going on. Because if you like look here, like your um, parotid is kind of where all the facial nerve comes through. So that if you've lacerated the facial nerve, that's that can be very important to a patient and they might need someone to repair that. Um, and then the platysma is like right over where all these, um, all of your vasculature is. So that can be um, an injury that you may wanna be getting your head or neck uh, surgeons involved in. And for exam, other pearls, I think chest and abdomen are both pretty um, straightforward. Um, what we're looking for, um, you know, tenderness and ecmosis, rigidity. Um, for the pelvis, uh, checking if it's stable. Once again, this should only be done once. Um, check the, the pelvis for stability. And if it seems like you're going to have a pelvic fracture, it's important to get on uh, a pelvic binder or just a sheet, something that will hold the pelvis in place. And then blood at the meatus. Um, if you, you know, checking for GU injuries, that could be a sign that you might have something going on um, there as well. And then lastly, um, spine and extremities. Um, once again, looking for step offs, deformities. Um, but for your extremities, don't forget to do a good neurological function. Um, make sure that you're once again, not, uh, not having injury to nerves and then also palpating the, the compartments. And that's something you might want to go back and check again too, because a lot of these fractures can lead to a compartment syndrome and you don't want that to, to be, to be missed. And then lastly, uh, the, the ultrasound is really an extension of your physical exam. Um, I know you. I know. Um, I know you guys have uh, have uh, ultrasound in the in the emergency departments. There um, is is the ultrasound used commonly for the for the trauma patients you have. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah, we usually use uh, IFASA on a trauma patient. Perfect. Yeah. And I think they're going to go through, uh, there's going to be another lecture that might go through some of the specifics of it. And of course, that means once again, we're just reviewing a lot of stuff that you guys do know, but um, it's great because it can identify a lot of um, a likely area of bleeding or a pneumothorax or a pericardial effusion pretty quickly, probably quicker than you can get the x-rays to come and um, and be done. Um, but of course, it's always user dependent. Um, the more you do, the better you are at finding these things. And then the big thing is not to use it to rule out bleeding, kind of like we talked about on all the other tools that we have. Um, finding a positive fast can help you um, identify that there is bleeding, but just because you have a normal fast does not should not reassure you that there is no bleeding. And remember that these things can once again change. So you can always refast your patients again later. So a negative fast right now may not be negative a little bit later, but if you're really concerned, you should be getting further imaging. This is not 
a tool that can be used to rule out bleeding, um, especially something like a retroperitoneal um, bleed is not going to even show up in your in your fast, most likely. So just a, a summary of kind of all of the, the pearls here. Um, you know, our job, we have to identify these critical diagnoses and then intervene when necessary and prevent uh, worsening any of the injuries as well. Uh, I think we've all have our trauma algorithms that are really helpful and the tools that we use that um, we can evaluate quickly, but use them to make sure that you are um, um, not for missing anything in your exam and you are considering the sick patients and bad diagnoses quickly, but they're not perfect and they don't need to be adhered to exactly. You really should be taking into account um, the mechanism and the patient you have in front of you and using these things to potentially maybe increase your concern, but it shouldn't be um, something that reassures you. And anytime something changes, reassess often starting from your primary um, survey as well. And lastly, don't underestimate getting a good history since medical and traumatic diagnoses coexist. Um, and a lot of times we're just taught trauma without thinking about that. And remember that sometimes you're going to need immediate action, but it can be temporary. So, and you don't need to have the uh, permanent, uh, permanent intervention because sometimes you do need to resuscitate or identify or work on something else first. And that is okay. But that's some of the stuff that you need to be thinking about when we go through all of this. Um, that's like main thing. Did you guys have uh, some questions about the run the run through of sweet all right um okay so all right we have a case then um and here we have the chief complaint it's a 16 year old male brought in after being injured during a football game so what are you looking for? What are you um, uh, doing as the patient is rolling in? Any thoughts? I know it's a very vague. I would want to know what kind of uh, injury that brought him to the ER and very good uh, history. Yeah. And exactly. So right now, you know, that's all the information we have so much. So they, it would be great. Usually it'd be nice if they are able to give um, the vitals or, um, you know, some more of the story before they come in. But let's say for this patient, um, that wasn't so possible. So, but yeah, I agree with you. That's what I would want to get more information because then that would also help me with setting up my trauma bay. Because if, if I know it's a patient that's really sick, then we can kind of make sure we have our full team. Um, if they have any indications that we might be needing, you know, uh, certain things set up for procedures, um, you know, it would be good to have some information, but, you know, we don't have as much right now. Um, so you patient comes in and basically right away, we can see their appearance. And from that, I think you can get a lot of information. So he arrives on a backboard with a C collar and he is uncomfortable and he's moaning in pain and he has his arms just over his abdomen. Um, from just this alone, I think we can pretty much kind of tell the first couple things in our, uh, in that we're trying to identify, which is that his airway is intact and there's no obvious sort of hemorrhage control that needs to be done that we can see. Um, so already we're kind of almost done with that sort of primary survey uh, that we're trying to do. Um, so what are the next priorities now that you kind of know this airway is intact, you see the patient, Okay, uh, the next step, uh, I will evaluate uh, his uh, vital side, uh, especially in that shock. Uh, how about uh, heart rate and uh, uh, blood pressure? 
if the pressure is low, uh, I will uh, um, evaluate his uh, abdominal by fast. If uh, fast have uh, free blood, um, I will uh, um, uh, take a uh, uh, place uh, IV line and give, uh, give uh, uh, Ristoloid uh, blood under one uh, lid and uh, will uh, active uh, MTB. Yeah. yeah. So you're yeah. like, yeah, so you have like the whole, um, <laughs> I know, right? These cases are always so um, absolutely like you're, you're already thinking um, way ahead, which is, which is great. Like that's the way we need to be thinking about these things. Um, and um, it'd be great to do all those things, but in real life, it happens so slowly to kind of get some of those things like your vital signs. So, you know, um, mm -hmm. Some so you yeah perfect though you would want to see if someone will get the get a blood pressure so but while you're getting their blood pressure you can check in their extrem you know you check the the pulses and the extremities and have his strong pulses and all his extremities so you know that his blood pressure is probably at least a systolic of ninety right and you know his breathing is seems to be somewhat fast but um you hear equal breath sounds because he you know he could be holding his stomach but you don't know whether there's something going on in the chest as well. Right. And we still don't even have the history, um, uh, from, from the patient or from EMS. We kind of just have that one liner. So we want to know, make sure we're covering everything. So let's see. Um, we would also want to do kind of going through that GCS and the expose the patient to see whether other injuries that are going on. Right. Um, so for the for the GCS, he's his his pupils are responsive. He opens them spontaneously. He answers the questions appropriately and moves all extremities. So this is pretty easy right now because I was going to ask you what the GCS is, but it's pretty obvious that it's um, that it's basically just 15 right now, which is good. Um, and the patients are the, the patients being exposed right now. So you can look at his skin. Um, I haven't given you the vitals yet just because I think generally in real life, um, this would all be doable before you would even be able to get your vitals. And so you should be trying to do all of this while the vitals are getting, um, getting done. Um, and then you can get your history as well, right? I know already somebody had asked for the history. So now we finally have the history. Um, the patient tells you the EMS tells you the patient jumped up to kick the ball and may have collided with another player and fell. Uh, patient lost consciousness and had some left-sided chest pain and received 500 cc's of fluids in, um, in the ambulance for tachycardia and hypotension. So I guess they were hypotensive with the patient, uh, with, with the EMS. And now we do have our vital signs. And, um, as I think, you know, as Dr. Wynn has met, had mentioned, you know, um, we'd be looking for what that blood pressure and heart rate are. And I think it seems pretty, pretty concerning at this point. Yeah. Um, ooh. so given this info, um, next actions. And I, I think, I think you kind of had mentioned some of the really good next actions now that we have this vital signs already, um, which would be ideally doing that, um, the fast, which I didn't put on here, but I completely agree. Um, and then putting this patient on the monitor, right. And getting those IV lines, um, you know, and giving something maybe for the pain and getting the patient's history since they're talking to you. Um, it's, yeah. So, but, um, but I agree. Um, if you can get that ultrasound over and to start looking at the ultrasound, that would be helpful as well, but we don't want to forget about doing some of these other things uh, in the meantime, with the patient's history, when you talk to them, um, what are some of the, the questions that you want to ask us now that you have an EMS, uh, history as well? 
or some of the information you definitely would want to get from the patient. Uh, the, the, the question I want to ask about is uh, uh, medical allergy, allergy to food uh, medicine, uh, and um, uh, what type of uh, of blood? Oh, what type of blood? Oh, okay. I... Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, those are exactly those are important. Um, since he's talking to you, um want to get that medication history and surgical history and his account of what happened um, would also be important because EMS is just probably telling you from who, who knows, right? So he says that he was jumping for a pass and then um, he was hit by the defender's helmet on the left side of his belly and they both fell and he didn't hit his head and he doesn't think he lost consciousness, but and he's having some worsening pain in his abdomen, but he does not, says no, no, um, no medications, like especially something like blood thinners, aspirin, obviously he's young, but still worth asking and no medical history, surgical history, <clears throat> um, and no other, um, drugs, cigarettes, anything like that. So, um, so what are the diagnoses that you're concerned about as you go into your secondary survey and starting to look at the rest of the body? The diagnosis uh, I uh, look I uh, concerned about the most is uh, uh, hemorrhagic shock, maybe hemorrhagic shock, and uh, blunt trauma uh, in uh, thoracic and abdominal. We need yeah. to rule out. We need to rule out uh, active bleeding. We need to find where. Uh, is active leading in uh, this patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. And I mean, you you are already thinking about it from like the moment we got the 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 one liner about the patient. But the abdominal injury is probably the chest and abdomen would be where I'm most concerned, just like you. But I just put on this next list, kind of the exhaustive list, because you know we, we don't yet have. Um, the full physical exam. So, you know, those would be the things that are probably more, more likely, but still we would want to make sure that we are not missing something that would be like cardiac or um, uh, rib fractures, um, any sort of spinal injuries, um, it, abdominal. So we're looking, you know, bladder, pancreas, um, pelvic um, fractures, you know, probably not intracranial injuries, but, you know, we'll check his, uh, do a good neuro exam and make sure. Um, so it's more like an exhaustive list. But, yeah, probably not as much. But once we go through the physical exam, I think it will narrow it down even more. Um, so I think kind of to your point of uh, those injuries, what kind of physical exam findings are you looking for that might lead you to one thing or another? Probably, and maybe you've were mentioning it before. I think possibly already, but um, the kind of signs signs of some of those things, which would be a lot of like the bruising and tenderness, ecchymoses, um, anything like that, would probably be something I'd be concerned about. And then also looking at um, the extremities as well, and making sure there wasn't something extra going on there. Um, not that those would rule in or rule out anything going on, but um, so we get like this whole full physical exam Man. and we basically have a normal head, ears, nose, all of that exam. And you, luckily there's no spinal tenderness um, and chest and lungs, you know, even though this patient has belly pain, that would be something important to really look at because a lot of times you're, you're going to have um, a concurrent um, chest and uh, lung injury. So, but those look normal too. And we basically see that there's an abrasion on the epigastric region and some tenderness, guarding, uh, some and some flank ecchymoses. 
um, and some tenderness to the right pelvis, but the pelvis is stable. Um, once again, also abdominal injuries, you want to think about GU. So don't forget to, to fully expose the patient and check and make sure that they don't have um, signs of a GU injury in addition. Um, mm -hmm. And this is all pretty much normal too. It, extremities are normal and neuro exam is normal. Um, just some bruising over the right buttocks um, for additionally additional skin exam. Yeah. Okay. So um, what are your top diagnoses now with the physical exam? I think he's a far from a uh, rupture splenic. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, I, you know, this particular case kind of gives you all the clues, which in real life, I don't know that they would give you in real life. We don't have everything, but um, agreed something abdominal is, is pretty concerning, especially with that flank um, bruising that should make you pretty concerned for um, a like kidney or splenic trauma. Mm -hmm. um, I would still also be concerned about a retroperitoneal mm -hmm. um, bleed or hematoma um, with the epigastric um, uh, bruising. Uh, you also concerned about a traumatic like pancreas injury um, and a diaphragmatic trauma could still be something that's happening. Uh, bowel perforation still possible, probably wouldn't have as much of the, the bleeding, but those are all kind of things that can be probably would be in the top of my diagnoses uh, to be considering. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I gave you that patient's history, um, but what if this patient actually told you they felt weird and they they actually fainted before waking up on the ground and had been hit by another player? Uh, what other diagnoses would you be considering? I would be considered for uh, head trauma as well. Anything else? Patients are, uh, you know, um, playing football. It's like out in the sun and they have some, they feel weird. They, and they basically, they, they syncopize and then they get like, hit. Struck. Hmm? Uh, heat stroke. Heat stroke. Yeah, I heat you stroke. know, yeah, heat stroke. I um, you know, we we got a temperature mm -hmm. on, on and for this patient, but a lot of times actually the temperature. I don't, you know, sometimes it's not a priority when people are doing vital signs. Um, so something to consider. But this is kind of one of those things again where um, definitely want to make sure you get a good history because if the patient had had something like that where they felt kind of off, they fainted beforehand, I would be consider, um, I would worry also about some medical things going on, especially a young person playing sports. Um, one of the first things they got too is a cardiac dysrhythmia that could have caused something like that. Um, you know, a seizure, if he's having a, like a first time seizure, um, heat stroke and from heat stroke, uh, he could have had like a rhabdo. Um, and then, you know, PE or other cardiac ideology probably more unlikely but um but yeah don't don't forget because somebody like that could still be pretty badly injured and have something like one of those intra-abdominal um injuries and some of these things might be going on and some of them you know wouldn't necessarily need <clears throat> to follow it up right this minute um you know there's more pressing things but some of them are things that could potentially be um be important to 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 get a to think of right um, so, all right. So I think, you know, at this point we're thinking about kind of the consults imaging labs and what we're going to give patient. I think we all kind of talked about the fact that this is a pretty sick patient. So hopefully uh, you've already talked to the surgeons and, <laughs> um, about, about seeing the patient and, and uh, as it is, um, what are some labs that you'd want to get?
pretty straightforward stuff. I think, um, you know, nothing's going to help you in the exact moment, but still getting a hematocrit, a lactate, um, a CMP, lipase and coags, um, you know, if we had the, that, the kid who had had that questionable syncope, um, I would get the EKG as well. Um, but that doesn't need to be done right now if he's critically ill. But um, and then for the imaging, um, what kind of imaging would you guys want to get? Maybe some EFAST first and then the CT if you have the abdomen. Also a chest x ray. Yeah, it, exactly. Um, you know, chest and, ex, uh, chest and pelvis. And yeah, hopefully that EFAST we're just getting right now. And then, like you said, the CT, but really depending on it, whether the patient is stable or not, which, um, <laughs> which then we would want to continue to reassess our patients and, you know, seeing the repeat exam, uh, we basically have um, the patient is still tachycardic and has a blood pressure of 89 over 59 and is now kind of looking worse. He's kind of closing his eyes and only opens them to voice, does not spontaneously. So, you know, GCS is decreasing a bit. Um, it sounds like, so at this point, I think, I actually think you guys already said it too. So obviously, you know, if you haven't already given blood, now would be a good time to give blood. And, you know, you can definitely hang uh, a liter of fluid while waiting for the blood, but it's ideal to, once you feel pretty certain that this is a hemorrhagic um, etiology, uh, giving blood is going to be much better than giving too much fluid, which is cold and will cause more acidosis and coagulopathy and can be um, actually worse for the patient. If it's the only thing you have, that's fine. But if we're able to give um, blood emergently, uh, that would be ideal. Um, yeah. So here's your chest x-ray. We'll get through all this pretty fast since you guys were pretty, um, anything on it? All right. It's a P is normal. Yeah, exactly. We might go through some of this stuff a little quick since I think you guys are, you know, kind of got to the crux of the of the of the case. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I'd specifically be looking if I missed anything um, in uh, uh, like a diaphragmatic rupture or um, because he had pain in that same sort of area and, <clears throat> you know, something like a hemothorax or something like that if um, on these if I or if I saw like uh, rib fractures. Um, and then we have our pelvis. We felt a stable pelvis, but here we have our x-ray. And of fracture. Yeah, this one's also normal. It's so normal. yeah, it's also normal. But and you know, it's always hard. Sometimes the, the x-rays in, in kids too are uh, a little bit harder because of all their, their growth plates and things like that. But yeah. So we're not seeing um, anything much here. And then we got a fast, the video I was trying to upload was having, I was having difficulty with, but here we have our uh, full. So we, this is, we have our lungs. This a line. And how yep. about uh, lung siding? Yep, exactly. So, you know, because it's not video, but you can see here that there's this, the, the lines, the end mode. Um, so this is normal. And we got our cardiac view. I think we're not really expecting it to be bad. So, um, and then I know are the areas that we care about. So right upper quadrant, let's look for you guys. And so in the right upper quadrant, it looks normal to me. There's no, the fluid in the abdomen on the lung. Yeah. And then, of course, the what I think we were all kind of looking for, the left upper quadrant. Um, no. And yeah. this is me, we see 
Uh-huh. Yeah. Laceration of the spleen. Yeah, exactly. So, and this one looks like a pretty bad one um, with some of this hematoma and a lot of blood there. So kind of what all of you guys were thinking was going on with the patient um, in this case was pretty much happening. Sometimes, you know, it, it could look like this as well with the with the free fluid just between the spleen and the, the kidney. But the other one um, was a little bit like a worse with a hematoma. Um, and then, of course, don't forget to finish your FAST exam, even once you find a positive finding. So, you know, this is the bladder, which also is normal. Um, so would you guys to advocate for CT first or to the OR? Okay. In this patient, uh, his uh, hypodynamics is unstable and uh, uh, FAST, so that uh, is his... Uh, free food, maybe uh, blood, blood in uh, his uh, abdominal. So the first, he uh, need to transfer to operating room. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah. you know, if the pot, if the fast was not positive, I think that's where there's a little bit more gray area. And um, sometimes then you know you really do want to work with your surgeon because if they think that the patient with enough blood might be able to go to CT, sometimes they will want you to get the CT in case um, in case it can be IR that is able to go and, you know, uh, uh, and just uh, take care of this, like this, the splenic bleed or something like that. So <clears throat> it will be a discussion with surgery on some of those um, grayer areas, because sometimes it's not so clear cut and we do have to work with our surgeons. And it is true that they can, they're better able to evaluate when they have a CT. But yeah, with a positive fast and hemodynamically stable, that's a pretty easy straight to the OR. But um, sometimes, you know, a lot of the times we fall in the gray area and we need to find, I think if it is in that gray area, then at least try to get the patient, you know, blood. And um, if they have to go to CT because of, you know, the thing with the surgeons and, you, you know, then... Then, then at least make sure to try to get them as stable as you can. So, but yeah, for this patient, it's straight to the OR. And as you said, hemorrhagic shock, splenic rupture. Just a couple of little pearls before we go. Um, the spleen and liver are the most commonly injured in blunt trauma. Uh, and the spleen is especially bad because it has, it's so vascular that it will, um, it, it, it filters an estimated 15% of our total volume per minute. So you can use, lose a lot of blood when you have a splenic injury. Um, it is true. Some of the, um, the, the, the minor splenic lacerations are not going to maybe have, um, be as dramatic as this, but if you're having a pretty much a splenic rupture, which looked like in this fast mm -hmm. picture, it's going to be pretty bad and they're going to need emergent surgery. Um, once again, continually reassess your patient and be treating along with evaluating your differential diagnoses. And don't forget to consider medical and traumatic causes. So, you know, even in this guy, like the, don't forget that the, the young, the young kid on a, on a, on a fo football field can still have some cardiac causes or heat stroke, things like that. So make sure you get that history um, from EMS and from the patient. And um, start blood early when blood loss is suspected uh, as well. So yeah, and just remember using the tools is always helpful. And like, I, clearly everyone knows the algorithms, but there is a lot of it that you, we still need to be very thinking critically about how we're using all of those tools and keeping our index of suspicion high based on mechanism um, as well. So, uh, but yeah, any any last questions in the last couple minutes? Yeah, so this is just the intro. So we'll be able to go deep dive on some of the other stuff um, in the next couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I think we have a holidays, I think, coming up, right? I think. Yeah. Okay, well, enjoy the holidays and we'll see you soon then. Yeah, thank you.